Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Malt House Games Podcast. My name is Delton. I'll be your host today. And with me, as usual, is my lovely wife and yellow player, Haley. Hello, Starshine. The Earth says hello. So today is episode number 157 of the Malt House Games Podcast. We are a podcast all about board games, card games, tabletop games, role playing games, dice games, things of that sort, and usually beer, but today, tea. Yes, we have the Aldi special. So if you're not familiar with Aldi, I don't know where you do your grocery shopping, but you're spending way too much money. You need to go to Aldi. Nothing really is on brand, but it's all on points. And today we have the Aldi special Benner pumpkin spice flavored black tea. It, I don't like the smell, but that's because I never like the smell of spiced things. I always think of potpourri or like a chai latte. I don't like that spiced flavor. And generally I don't like that. Uh, sorry, I don't like the spiced scent. And I generally don't like spiced flavor like that either. But this one he does like. I like the flavor of because it's gentle. It's a very gentle pumpkin spice. It's not overly fake. You get more tea than anything. And so it's actually a really nice warm tea for a fall day. And I think the spice smell is wonderful. I love things that smell like spice. It reminds me of fall. And so this is one of my favorite teas. It is also $1.39 at Aldi for about 30 tea bags. So 10 out of 10 do recommend for multiple reasons. And today we are drinking this because we're on Delton's lunch break. We are. We're on lunch right now. It is 2.29 p.m. on a Friday. And uh, we're going to record this tonight. And I need to get it edited, um, preferably Saturday morning at the latest, because we've got a few things we're doing this weekend. But we are, are also prepping for BGG Con. Uh, this coming week. So if you listen to this, uh, we will be going to BGG Con in Dallas, Texas from uh, Wednesday through Sunday. Yes. And so our next episode, we'll give you a full rundown, all of the fun things we get to do with our two friends, Tyler and Alan. Yes. We'll get to hang out with them and play games and see other friends that go. And it's going to be a great time. And I'm very excited and very ready uh, for this little trip. So what have we been doing the last two weeks, Delty Poo? The last two weeks has been wrapping up Halloween or uh, I guess October for the most part. It's really been work, just work, and then trying to, you know, I don't know. I feel like Halloween and October in general was, for me, just movies, movies, movies. As I said, I watched 55 movies, 51 new to me, and uh, that was a chore, and then we hit November and just had some stuff to do, and I just feel like we've been kind of busy with life. And also with wrestling. We did get to go to Wichita, Kansas. It's about a two-hour drive from us. Uh, we drove up with Haley's sister, our friend Eddie. We met up with Brian and Jessica, and we watched AEW Collision last Saturday, which the show itself was okay, but it was very fun to be there live. Wrestling, whether it's good or, you know, not the greatest match, is still fun to be part of live. Absolutely. And beforehand, we got Wheat Street Dogs, which is a vegan hot dog cart. Absolutely fantastic. It's their own recipe for a vegan hot dog and then you can get it however you want. Haley had their, uh, what was it, Frito Chili Pie. Yes, the Frito Chili Pie was like a lentil chili, and it was delightful. But what I liked best about it is that it is a traditional hot dog cart because it was traditional hot dog cart prices. It was, yeah. I got a hot dog, uh, which is obviously has got the bun, and then I just did the toppings you add yourself. And so I did uh, mustard, relish, and sauerkraut. I prefer that just classic kind of brat style, but no onions for me. Um, I did that. I think it's like six bucks. Yes, my little Frito chili pie was five bucks, and I cannot complain about that. No, like it's that's higher than a hot dog cart used to be, but all food prices have gone up. It's also a specialty vegan cart, and that's still extremely inexpensive compared to a lot of places that offer a vegan hot dog. So I was very happy with the quality and the flavor of it, and we definitely want to go back to Wichita just to get it and then go see more of Wichita. Absolutely. It was a really fun experience. So if you're in the Wichita area, check out Wheat Street Dogs. Follow them on Instagram. They're open like two days a week. At uh, breweries and at, cideries and stuff. Yes, at cideries. We, the, it was located outside of White Crow Cider whatever. And that place is neat because they have both alcoholic and non-alcoholic ciders that are homemade. So check it out if you're in Wichita. It was a cool place, cool people, and a cool experience. It really was. It was very, very fun. Uh, they're actually, AEW is coming back through Oklahoma City or sorry, coming to Oklahoma City for the first time on December 20th, which will should be their Christmas episode of Dynamite, their Wednesday night show. So I'm very excited. We'll get to see it. And after the two-hour Dynamite, they'll record the one hour of Rampage. So we'll get a three-hour show right downtown, a 20-minute drive from us. 
I'm very excited to be able to see that right here in the hometown. Yes, very grateful. And so aside from waiting for BGGCon, you know, tomorrow we have a board game day with our friend Brian and maybe some fall adventures this weekend. But other than going to AEW, going to Wichita, working and just living life to the fullest, we've also been playing a couple of games. Oh, here's the door. It's straight ahead. It's it's a game. So I don't know if you know this, but November 29th is Haley's birthday. Hell yeah, brother. I'm going to get me a ham radio. That's the day every year that she catches up to me in age, which means we will both be 32 for her birthday. And I always end up getting her board games. And I know the irony of they're kind of for me as well, gifting a board game to your spouse. Uh, but I'm still gifting her some board games or at least a board game. It's okay. I'm kind of, one, I like board games. Two, I know it's like a gift for himself too. Um, two things to that. One, I always get you like bread making gadgets for Christmas and that's definitely for me. And you've bought me board games. And I've bought you board games I also enjoy. And three, I just like to tell the story. So I talked to my sister earlier today and so there's like this concept of theory of mind in kids that really doesn't develop till like five or six. And so uh, with theory of mind means their ability to like place themselves in someone else's shoes. And uh, so basically that's why you have a, a kid like the age of four. If you ask them, what does mom want for Christmas? They're going to say they want it. Mom wants a Lightning McQueen car because they want a Lightning McQueen car. So, of course, everybody else does. And so my niece, my sister was asking her, what should we get? Hey, hey, for a birthday. And she says, we should take her to the kids paint and palette, which is what Lakin wants to do. But I said, you know what? I would love to spend my birthday doing a kids paint and palette with Lakin. That sounds great. It's fine. As long as you're included in whatever the gift is <laughs> yes. and it's thoughtful in some manner, then it works, right? Yes, because we did that for Mother's Day this year and it was incredibly fun. Oh, for sure. And we'll still have a good time. But that being said about Haley's birthday coming up, this was actually an early present. I was going to wait for her birthday, but I thought, you know what? A, this will be good for the podcast. B, I think she'll like it and it will give us something to do from here to her birthday and even past that. And so I just thought I was going to give it to her early, ended up doing it, and here we are. So the game for today is Dorf Romantic the Board Game. Um, Dorf Romantic the board game is actually based off of a video game called Dorf Romantic that was a big hit, in my understanding, at the beginning of the pandemic. Now, I have not played the video game, but based on the board game, I can tell you exactly how it's going to work. So Dorf Romantic is a cooperative tile placement game. It's one to six people, ages eight and up. It is designed by Lucas Zack and Michael Palm, illustrations by Paul Reba. Graphic design by Jens Visa and realization by Klaus Ottmeyer. So this is a game. Oh, I guess I should say it's uh it's brought to the U.S. by Pegasus Spiele, and it is actually licensed by Tucana Interactive, which is a toucan. It's a cute little toucan. Yeah, toucan inter or Tucana Interactive, a toucan. Uh, so yes, it is a cooperative tile placement game. Here's the thing about this game, y'all. It's really easy, barring. Missing one rule, <laughs> uh, and barring two special rules that kind of take a second to understand because the way they're written. Not only is it easy, it is relaxing. I love this game. This is, you know, we talked a couple of episodes ago, I guess it was four episodes ago, about decision fatigue, like getting home and not being able to uh, make hard and fast decisions because your brain's tired. This is the game that is perfect for those with decision fatigue. Oh my goodness. Well, what's nice about it is, Every decision in this game is, I'm going to place this tile. Where should I place it to potentially get the most points? And as much as that sounds like it's super open and you could place it anywhere for all these points and here and there and you're doing all this math in your head, it is not at all that way. It's, oh, I need to place this down. It's got trees. Are there any place that we can get points for trees? There is. I'm going to put it there. That's essentially the complexity of these decisions for the most part. It gets a little more complex the further the game goes, which we'll get into. But the game is going to start. There are two different tiles. Uh, sorry, two different types of tiles. There are task tiles, which give you the goals that you're working toward that continuously will either be completed or broken. And no matter what, you're going to try to complete as many as possible in a game. And then there are landscape tiles, which are simply the different types of landscape tiles. So think of any other tile placement game. Carcassonne, Alhambra. My, I immediately blanked on other tile placement games. 
it's tile placement, right? You put a tile down, things connect, you're good to go. In this game, there are very few different types of landscapes in these landscape tiles. There's forest, grain, village. Yeah, forest, grain, and village. Those three do not have to connect to the same thing. They don't have to match forest to forest, village to village, or grain to grain. The only ones that actually have to connect are the streams, like a river, and the track, which is a railroad track. Those are the only things that must connect only strictly railroad to railroad and stream to stream. Aside from that, everything else you can put anywhere you please, however you please. It's almost brain fart proof. Almost. Almost. Uh, the task tiles are going to have these different, same different elements on them, but they're also going to have tasks uh, present, which is a little like talking bubble with a symbol on it. The symbol is going to be indicative of one of the five five different types of terrain, the forest grain village stream track. On your turn in the beginning of the game, you have to have at all times three tasks out on the table and up to where you're working toward them. So the first player takes a task tile, puts it in the middle of the table. The second player does another one. The third player does another one. And then the next player gets to put a landscape tile. You're going to build landscapes trying to match the goals on these task tiles. So the task tiles is a tile itself. It also have the, has these task markers. Those task markers indicate whether completing the task gives you four, five, or six points. That's also how many tiles that need to represent that terrain type are included in that connection. So if you have one tile uh, that's a task tile and it's telling you that you need a five forest, then you need a consecutive connecting group of forests in the artwork across five different tiles. And when you place the fifth one, you have completed that task. You now get five points for that task. Then the next player in line is going to grab a task tile, flip it, put a new task marker on it, and find the best place for it to go out on the board. Now, that's one of the rules we messed up immediately in our first three of, four of our four games is you flip the task tile, you put how many points or how many tiles it needs to connect to on it before placing it into the grouping. We were just playing the first three on challenge mode, and honestly, our very first game on challenge mode was one of our highest scoring games. It was our second highest scoring game of our four by a good margin compared to the games two and three, but that's a critical, uh, critical rule for this game. But you're going to do that, and then you're just going to play. You're going to try to finish as many tasks as possible. You want the longest stream possible, the longest railroad track cha uh, chain possible. You're going to do that until the game is over, which is either you're out of landscape tiles. The game ends when you need to place a landscape tile and there are zero landscape tiles left. And there's not a ton. In the whole game, there are 48 landscape tiles, three of which get taken out at the beginning of the game. So you're working with 45 tiles of the landscape type. There are 25 tasks. So unless you can put all 25 task tiles out, it's good luck, you know, uh, uh, you not, basically good luck running out of landscape tiles and task tiles in the same game. You're going to run out of landscape far before task tiles unless you're playing really well. But that's the entirety of the game is making sure there's three tasks, trying to complete them with your landscape tiles, when you complete one, put down a new task tile and keep going from there. There are a few other scoring things such as flags, which is make a giant section of all houses or villages, whatever they're called, and make sure that it's closed off and not open to be connected to. And then boom, you're going to get points for that. Things like that. Now, what make this game special aside from, hey, let's see how many points we can get. It's, hey, let's see how many points we can get. And based on that, we are now going to advance on this little track and begin into the campaign factor of this game. So what made this game something I wanted to get for Haley was the fact there was a campaign element. I saw the video review from No Pun Included on YouTube. I suggest checking it out if you want to see this game in action and listen to what they have to say. But they had it on there, and I've seen this a few times, and I thought, I, I'll watch the video. I've, I've enjoyed their videos lately a lot, and uh, I wanted to watch it and see what they had to say. And he showed, uh, Efka showed how the game was played. I can't remember if Elaine was in it, but they were showing how the game was played. And I was like, well, that's really simple. You know, I, whatever, it's easy enough. I don't think this is ne necessarily something that I want. But then they started talking about, there's never a loser. There's no competition. It's cooperative. It's like, well, that's nice, though. It's like, who can get the most points? But 
that effect really wears off on me, even in video games after a while. But then they said it was a campaign game. And based on how good you do, you draw so many little, you know, fill in the little circles on the track, and you unlock boxes, which unlock new things in the game, new elements, new goals for you to achieve. And each new goal you achieve adds new things to the game, whether it be tiles, scoring methods, other things like that. And slowly you have this game open up to be more capable of getting higher points in your games while also giving you more things to consider, more goals to go toward. And sometimes in one game, you're going to want to achieve a certain goal. And the next game, you might try for something different instead because you'll have multiple things to go for. And I really liked the idea that you'll cooperatively sit down and build out your tiles, just like in Carcassonne, where it's always fun to look at the you know world you've built in front of you. It's just kind of fun. This one's the same way, but it's nice knowing that I'm not just going to be playing the same game, getting the same points, and being in the same realm. I'm slowly going to add, slowly have a better chance at higher score, and give me these achievements to try for. And I just think there's something really fun about that, and I thought, Haley is going to like the way that this is played. And by George, he was right. This has quickly shot up to one of my new favorite games, this is one that I think will be really fun to play, too. Let's say we're, like, watching Christmas movies or just hanging out and we're tra- needing something to pass the time. This would be an easy one just to get out and play. The setup is absolutely so simple. You get the box opened up once you, everything's punched. You shuffle the landscape tiles face down, throw them over in as many piles as you want them to be. You shuffle the task tiles. You put them over there. You discard three landscape tiles before the game starts. You make sure the task tokens are to the side. And then the first player places a task marker, and you're good to go. Like, task tile with a marker on, and that's it. That's the whole setup. The game's simple. Now, it gets, it only gets more complex later because there are a few extra things, whether it's put this card next to the play area so you can see what achievement you're trying to go for, or put this new piece that gives you something new to work on scoring right here. Or, you know, hey, we've got some extra tiles. Don't shuffle those in until after you've discarded three for the game. But the rules never get complex for setup. The setup takes no time. It's just a minute or two. The gameplay for me and Haley is between 25 and 35, I would say between 25 and 35 minutes every time. And that's at two players. Now, this does do one player, which I think could be a fun little one player game, but there's a video game of it. I'd rather do that since it's literally the same thing. And also Final Girl is on my shelf, which is still going to be my solo game of choice, even though it's complex. Uh, I don't know that I would want to play this with more than maybe three or four people. It goes to six. Oh, does it really? It goes to six, but with only 45 landscape tiles in play with six people, you're getting, how many turns is that potentially? Like minimum. Like eight. You're getting a minimum of eight. Now given there'll be more than that because of task tiles, but I, I don't, I don't think that it would be the most fun. I mean, given you're making decisions as a group. And so there is that cooperative element, but the decision space isn't so complex that six people would have to make that decision. However, what that does mean is a younger audience can easily be involved, have their own decisions, and it's not going to hurt the game. I think that's a really good point because I can see six of our adult friends sitting around playing this game and how it could possibly start to make us feel fatigued, you know, because not every decision is going to take six people. No. And so you might just be waiting around until your turn, you know, six turns later. But like you said, if we're playing with a, a younger audience, I think even like, for example, Zach and Sarah's little one, Avery, she's four. Mm-hmm. And this game isn't rated for four, but this could be a game that we could easily incorporate her in. Okay, Avery, here's your one tile. Because she's not having to choose between five different tiles. She picks up one tile. Where are we going to put it? And even if she says in her own volition, no, I'm putting this tile here. of the time, that's not going to matter. Yeah, it may not complete a goal immediately, but every tile placement and every section of a terrain, every single place you put something, can be built upon to work toward goals in the future. And so I think that that's something that, yes, I wouldn't want to play this with six adults, but if you played it with four adults that had a kid or two, and you wanted to include them in a gameplay, a game night, on a game that's not that difficult, you don't have to think too much. If somebody gets taken away from the game, it's not breaking immersion, nothing like that. This is going to be a really great game for that, for any kind of families. I mean, you know, even if we go home and play with, uh, you know, parents, grandparents, anything like that, it's an easy concept to grasp in this game. And again, being cooperative is always a bonus when including somebody who either 
is you know younger than they need to be or may not care too much about board games or want to put the thought in, it's easy to include in cooperative games. Everybody wins, nobody loses. It's a good time. I think so, but that's I don't know what else I can say about Dorf Romantic without digging into tiny detailed rules, which I don't want to do. Uh, we have only played four games of it so far, but we have unlocked three boxes of the five, I think. We have, yes. So that's really exciting, but that just means there's more achievements to work toward because it slowly gives you things to say, hey, now if you can complete this, you can unlock something else that can get you even more points. And it's like, oh boy, points. And so they they uh, they got you. They get you. They pull you in. You know, as simple as this game is, I think you're right, Delton. The best part about it is the campaign element. Hey, what can I get you? I'd like a topic. Any special way? Make it a top shelf topic. Coming up. Enjoy. So the topic for today that we wanted to discuss is campaign games. So more specifically, a campaign game, I'm going to make it inclusive of legacy style games, games that have mission scenarios that you can work through that either tell a story or even just presents different scenarios to get through to like finish it out. I'm, I'm going to include all of that in what I mean when I say a campaign game. But campaign games are, in my opinion, very divisive. And I think that has a lot to do with uh, something that I brought up whenever you brought this up as a topic idea, which for me is playing a campaign game with the same group. That is something that I think gives us a downside edge when it comes to campaign games. So where our experience might not be absolutely glowing with campaign games or the thought of campaign games, uh, a lot of that has to do with finding consistency within a group or finding a game that me and Haley both enjoy equally enough to continue by ourselves in a campaign. And finding a game that Delton's down playing multiple times whenever he has a big to-be-played shelf. That's also true. I like to play a lot of new games. It's fun. And so our very first experience with a campaign game, at least my experience, was the Pandemic Legacy Season 1. And so we originally started to play this Legacy game with our friend Brian. And I, what I really liked about that game was that your characters were affected by what happened. Your character could get PTSD. Your character could get injured. Your character could get sick. And the board changed as well. You put stickers on the board so... You know, areas might have fallen and they're gone for the rest of the game. Um, or, you know, areas might be damaged. But ironically, what kept us from finishing that Pandemic Legacy game was the actual pandemic. Because we started playing that with Brian in, what, 2019? Like, middle 2019? Yeah. And then, ironically, the pandemic started and so we weren't able to get together. And, you know, Delton and I, we didn't really want to play the game without Brian. And so there was, there was probably about a good, you know... 10, 12 months that we didn't play games with anyone aside from each other. Yeah. And so we, in that time, you know, we, we kind of lost our interest in it as well. Because with Pandemic, we like Pandemic. Pandemic was one of the first board games that Delton picked up, one of the first ones he introduced me to, like the OG Pandemic. But this one was, you know, again, not something that we could really play unless we had Brian around. And two, it didn't really, like, grab our attention as much. Like, we already have Pandemic. Uh, why would we, Delton and I, start a new legacy whenever we have Brian, who's already playing this one with us, and we have the regular pandemic as well? I mean, that's a lot of it is, you know, having an inconsistent group makes it hard because I didn't want to just say, hey, too bad, we're going to finish playing this or something like that. Um, so that, you know, that's definitely a difficult spot. And now that I, because I had it on my shelf for years, untouched, I recently sold it. We only played two or three games of it. I think it was three. Um, and I sold it for like 10 bucks and I said, look, we've played like three games. There's some stickers. And the guy was like, well, how, how much would it be to reset it? I said, there's a few stickers on the board. It was two or three missions. That's why I'm selling it for $10. It's virtually untouched at this point. Like have at it. If you hate it, use the components or something else. Like, you, I don't know, you know, whatever. Um, and the part of the problem is though, is now that we've gotten to the point where we are at this moment. Uh, the the pandemic just the game pandemic doesn't interest me as much as it did at that time too like, soon at that time pandemic legacy was super hot everyone was talking about it and it was like there's got to be something here and i've heard i need to just see what happens i've heard that the story and what happens is awesome but i don't like the gameplay loop of pandemic enough anymore to sit down and do that 12 to 24 times <laughs> 
and that's just that's difficult and that's also how you know uh with campaign games just like with role playing games when you're playing D&D with friends your tastes can change over time you'll develop and you know things will get better hotter or colder for you and that's something that is also a possibility when it comes to any kind of campaign structured gaming and that's not to diss pandemic legacy by any means cuz our friend no. Nick and Jennifer had a great time playing a two player yeah they played two player where each one uh controls two characters or two pieces and a lot of people like playing base pandemic that way because it provides more uh more ability to do things on a turn you can play it two player better that way uh and i think that that would work work really well but it's one of those games i just you know i don't i don't see myself coming back to it especially when i don't get through games like i don't play a game a lot of times in a row anyway it's just it's something i don't know it's hard for us but a legacy game that we have started and are really sticking with is Charterstone. We started that one last year. Is that right? I think so. We've played a few, three or four maybe times of Charterstone. Just me and Haley. I do think it would be better with four people because there'd be more going on. But so far, I've enjoyed the game. We like worker placement. Super simple. You put a person down, pick up stuff. I like that. Um, I like the way that the rules change in that and everything. But that's been my the first campaign or, you know, legacy game that as we've gotten into it, I've said, Ooh, I really like this. This is really neat. I really want to keep pursuing it. And we just haven't got back around to it yet, but also I feel like this year has been just been kind of wonky, but, uh, I've really enjoyed Charterstone. Its approach is, uh, it's, it's kind of the, would it be converse the right term of pandemic legacy where pandemic legacy places slowly die. And in Charterstone, it slowly grows. So it's kind of maybe the adverse converse at, I don't know. The con, the, it's the opposite. It's the mirror sort of, it's the upside down. Yeah. The flippy floppy. It's the flippy floppy of pandemic is Charterstone. Yes. Charterstone is a flippy floppy. And, uh, it's nice though, because you're slowly adding new places to go. You're slowly adding new things to the board and adding new pieces. And I really enjoyed, uh, that about it so far. And I think that's part of why I like Dwarf Romantic so far is it's slowly adding things in to do and giving you achievements to go for during it. And I really, I like that. It's fun. So aside from it just being us two, you know, I think the reason why we like Charterstone over Pandemic Legacy is because also the theme is different. It's a whole new different game. There's not just a Charterstone regular game. Like this is a, a legacy game. Yeah. And so we, I also like the theme a lot. Uh, you know, Pandemic, I, I think what also burned us out on Pandemic Legacy is that we played Pandemic regular version probably like 50 times. I wouldn't and say 50, but we played it a lot. We've played it a back, lot. Back in the beginning of our gaming. And so I think it was easier to get burnt out quicker on Pandemic Legacy, and we haven't had that with Charterstone. That's true. And one thing there is, like you said, Pandemic Legacy, it took Pandemic, a game that's been around forever, and then made a Legacy version, uh, which I think it might be the first like true Legacy game. I can't remember. Uh, but then Charterstone is a Legacy game, but once you finish, you can actually just play a worker placement game on your now finished completed world. Uh, which I don't know if I've told you that that's part of it was when it's done and you're done with the campaign, you can just play and that's your world, which could be different than somebody else's, which I thought that was a cool idea. Oh, absolutely. That's very neat. Yeah. I thought it was pretty cool. And now they sell recharge packs because Charterstone is not a fully permanent. The recharge packs are essentially all the stickers, all the cards, everything that you need. And you flip the board over and you have a second run at the game. If you want to do a new campaign with somebody else, pandemic legacy is going to, when you finish it, you're either going to frame it, keep it for like memories or trash it because there's not much else you can do. Right. Because there were times whenever you had to destroy cards, like that card is gone. That person is dead. You're supposed to. You don't have to. But I mean, if you want to follow the rules, you have to. It's brutal. But yeah, so Charterstone is just it's a little different. It's a little kinder in all its presentation, but it's fun. And also just worker placement works for us. And I can really foresee our new game Dwarf Romantic being one that we finish. I know that we got Charterstone first, but I have a feeling that Dwarf Romantic is going to be one we finish first because it is a very easy one to set up, a very easy one to, uh, whenever you earn something, to, uh, I guess, get it out of the box and incorporate it into the game. Yep. Charterstone takes a little bit more to set up, and that's not a bad thing. Charterstone yep. also is a longer game. It has more components and more things to do. Dwarf Romantic is very simple. You basically just open the box, get out the tiles, and bam, there you go. We're ready to roll. And so I think it's going to be easier for us to play that because like Delt said last night, we played it three times in a row. Yeah, super simple. Super easy to take apart, set back up, let's go. It's real simple, which helps. Uh, some, some of the other games that we've played that we haven't dug into a ton is like 
the LCGs. So we have Lord of the Rings, the card game I've talked about, which we haven't, I think we have one more mission left of the core box. And then I have the add-on one. Um, we got to do that. And then Arkham Horror, the card game, which we need to get back into because I've got a bunch of stuff for it now where that I've been collecting whenever stuff goes on super sale. So that, cause we want to run through more of it. Cause we had a good time with it. Just me and you. Um, but there's a lot. I mean, the crew technically has a mission log. You can go through all the quests, the crew deep sea or whatever it's called. Yeah. Mission deep sea, uh, Marvel champions, LCG has got its kind of campaign, but then you've got the one that everybody really loves in Gloomhaven, which is, you know, a mixture of an RPG and a board game. Uh, and it's a massive campaign style legacy sort of game where ca characters die and you got to just get a new character from my understanding without me knowing any of the actual rules. But it's pretty commonplace, and I think that what people like so much about campaign games, and I think we do too, is campaign games, they give you a sense of progression. It's not, I'm playing this game, the game's over, I win, I lose, we win, we lose as a group, whatever, and then we're done. Campaign elements add that progression. There's something more to earn. There's something more to lose, to try to avoid. There's a new challenge. It's the same game with some minor tweaks here and there, and I just think that it makes for a good time and potentially a good storytelling element when it comes to things like Pandemic Legacy and Gloomhaven and things like that. Uh, one that we haven't got to that I got you last year that I'm sad we haven't played, but it's, you know, again, it's a campaign game. Those are hard to get to the table all the time is Undaunted Stalingrad, the big uh, campaign style, you know, whatever of the Undaunted series. I want to get into it because of the way that the cities change and things like that. And I'm really excited to play it, but um, it's that progression, something about progression. I think people are fueled on it in general. You know what I like about them? What? It makes you play the same game more than once in a setting. Just because I like to play different games. Well, here's the thing. Sometimes I play a game and I'm like, that was fun. Let's play it again. Dilton's like, yeah. Or I say, let's play this game that we bought five years ago and only played once. And Dilton's like, no. No, I got new games over here I want to play. <laughs> it's shiny. There's all kinds of shiny new good things. And it's really going to be bad when we get back from BGGCon because yep. you have, basically, Delton is doing the flea market, and he's like, oh, I've earned $4 billion in the flea market, but I have spent $3.9 billion in the flea market. So at BGGCon, I've talked before about the bazaar, which is just a, a, a people set up tables, the sellers do, and you go in and you can haggle, you can barter, you can do whatever, but it's people selling games, you can buy them. Well, I didn't want to haul games down with the hope of selling. So there's the virtual flea market that they do, and they, ha they do this for a lot of cons. But the virtual flea market is you post your games, people can offer, you can make it bidding, you can make it fixed price, whatever, and you agree to all your sales. And then one of the nights at BGGCon, which is going to be Thursday night, I believe, um, one of the nights at BGGCon, the, if you've sold games, sold a certain amount, you get it uh, put at a table, you all go into a room between a certain time and another time, set it all up, and then all of the buyers will come and give you an envelope with cash, and you give them the game, or they can Venmo you if you want, whatever. Uh, and I've sold, at this point, like 36 or 37 games, I think, with the four that I've got rid of today, and I think I'm buying like 18. <laughs> so it sucks, but at the same time, I'm still coming out with cash in hand where I've profited, I've gotten rid of games that I'm not playing, or we don't like, or we're just needing to make space. And I'm getting ones that are some that I've always wanted. I've been wanting for years and years and never pulled the trigger and found a good deal because it's a flea market where good deals should be found. So I'm very excited to come home and have more new games, well, new to me games to talk about. So basically we have all the podcast episodes for 2024 already yeah. planned out. Essentially, yes. I have longer than that. But I think that that is the my own campaign progression of my life is slowly getting new games and getting rid of games we don't like anymore don't play anymore don't utilize anymore any of those reasons that's my progression into life but now we need to progress to the question so we can get done with this so i can go back to work and now join us for a malt house games podcast special bite size question so the question for this episode is what are you most looking forward to at bgg con 2023 so I know a given for us is seeing our friends, Alan and Tyler. And so that's definitely going to be like the thing we're looking forward to the most. You but, took my answer. But I think specifically what I'm looking forward to is the big vegan dinner with Alan that's and Tyler. That's what and all I was our just friends. thinking. Aha! That's what you get for letting me go first. Damn it. And so big vegan dinner is arranged by Alan every year. And it is Alan, Tyler, and then a bunch of Alan's friends. So we get to make lots of new friends, make lots of new connections, and get to have a big old vegan feast. 
uh, where everybody gets a vegan meal. We all get to try each other's food and just really enjoy good company. And so I am very much looking forward to the big vegan dinner this year. I'm sad that the spiral right there closed because that was always our go-to. Uh, we've it was So before, it was usually planned out by Ace, which hopefully he'll be there this year. Last year, he ended up getting COVID um, right before the con, so that was really sad. Luckily, everything went well and he's healthy. But hopefully he'll be here this year. He usually plans it. Last year it was Michelle that planned it. Alan's always just like a part of it, which is funny. Um, but we went to Spiral a uh, year before last, or whenever we went la- that last time. Spiral is where we've been going. Last year was that interesting. The vegan. Was it the vegan? The vegan. And it was really good. It was like, oh, you've got, you know, uh, fried catfish style stuff and whatnot. Very tasty. I wonder where we're going to go this year and who's going to do it. I need to reach out to some people and be like, hey, where are we eating food at, y'all? Because I'm hungry already. I know. I am very ready for some good Dallas vegan food. No, well, really, what are you looking forward to? Because that's be different than mine. Well, that was what I was going to say. Too little, too late. I mean, if I can't say friends and I can't say food, I guess it's just getting to play games and a lot of games and a, a bunch of new games and some dumb games and some smart games. Uh, just getting to play all the different games with all the different people we like. It's just fun. I'm I'm excited to have fun and relax and not go to work. There you Amen go. Amen to that. <laughs> Nailed it. But I think that's going to wrap up everything for this episode. I'll give a shout out and a thank you to our Patreon patrons. So thank you so much to Alan, Jennifer, and Cliff for supporting us on Patreon at the level in which you get shouted out on the podcast. If you want to find us on social media, you can at Malthouse Games, M-A-L-T-H-A-U-S Games. You can find Haley at S-Q-U-I-R-R-E-L-Y-G-E-K. That is at Squirrely Geek. You can always send us an email or reach out on social media or whatever, but our email is contact at malthousegames.com. Just let us know if there's a game you think we need to talk about, a topic we should cover, or a question you want us to answer, and we can do it. And if you're going to be at BGGCon next week, send us a message on Twitter or send us an email or send us a message on Instagram. We'd be happy to meet up, say hi, give a high five, maybe play a game. Absolutely. Try to reach out. We'll do our best. We can't promise that we'll not be busy, but uh, because we just we, we see a lot of friends, uh, but we will try our best to at least say hi and play a game or do something like that because we like talking to people at board game conventions. Making friends and kicking butt in board games. That is our motto. Exactly. But I think that's everything today. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the Malthouse Games Podcast, episode number 157. Until next time, sit back, relax, grab a drink, and play some games. See you folks later. Toodaloo. Bye.